right, folks. This is our first podcast of I Hemp United, where all we talk about is industrial hemp. We don't talk about CBD. We don't talk about THC. This is how we roll here. So let's get started with our first podcast. We are fortunate enough today to have Gail Killen with us. Gail comes from Ellicott City, Maryland, and she has been one of the innovators um, for the last, say, five to six years on how to use this amazing super plant called hemp. Why is it a super plant? Not because of the leaves, not because of the buds, not because of the oils. Yes, those are all awesome, and they're helping a lot of people. So we love them too. But all we're talking about, folks, is the stalk. The stalk of the hemp plant and how we can take that and process it into all these different fibers and different types of materials that can start replacing those destructive qualities of paper, plastic, wood, cement, um, clothing, rubber. It has so many characteristics. I call them superpowers. Super plant, superpowers. This is how um, I've been looking at it because every day I learn something more about what industrial hemp can do. Um, There's a ton of things that we'll talk about, about all the values, advantages. One of the biggest ones, one of the ones that everyone's most interested in is it can replace, like I said, a lot of those destructive materials with the same quality or better. And it is a carbon collector like you've never seen before. 2.4 acres of hemp grown from seed to harvest, collects about 22 tons of carbon out of the air. We were told if you sit in the middle of a hemp field and you have hemp all around you, the amount of oxygen put out from these plants is going to make you euphoric because of just the amount of carbon these plants are collecting. So that just to grow, collecting carbon. When it is put into a product, it is cellulose. It grows. It's a living, breathing thing. So it's still collecting uh, carbon. When it decomposes, it decomposes very nicely. And as it decomposes, it decomposes and takes the carbon with it. It can enrich soil. So when you grow this thing, it is actually enriching the soil that it's growing in. So for our farmers, my buddy back here, um, he is... um, our sage, so he is our guiding force. If everything we do, um, it all starts with and probably ends with the farmers. Um, the farmers have always been and will always be probably the linchpin of this U.S. economy, and in many ways, what has been the thing that has allowed us to grow as one of the greatest countries in the world. Of patriotism. All right, so when we're talking about industrial hemp, we're talking about the stalk of the plant. So if you can see this, this is just a um, piece of the stalk of the plant. And you'll see how the different types of fibers, materials are in there. And so what happens is when this comes to a, a machine, it will basically break out all those fibers. Um, and those fibers are very strong, very resilient. Um, do not hold mold. Pretty much water, not resistant, but water, um, you you don't have to replace anything. You just got to dry it, and then it will be back to its own normal situation. So uh, when we start talking about industrial hemp, we see um, that in the United States for the last, I guess, since 1930, we've been stuck in the sand of not doing anything really with industrial hemp. Um, The Europeans, Chinese, I mean, pretty much the rest of the world have been doing amazing things with industrial hemp or building um, for a lot of things that um, we sort of know are capable from this plant, but we just haven't been able to do it because of regulations, restrictions, and all those kinds of things. And so um, in 2018, the Farmers Act um, opened up the ability for farmers to start growing hemp without restrictions. Well, I'll say there's restrictions, but it wasn't illegal anymore. And so what we had is this explosion of CBD market, um, and a lot of farmers started growing hemp for CBD. 
And then the market got a little saturated and some of those farmers now got stuck with having a lot of um, plants that they can't do anything with. The beautiful, beautiful thing about this plant is not does it, it doesn't only have those qualities of the leaves, the buds and the seeds, but that stalk, that part that most people throw away, they don't anymore, but they used to, um, can now be basically processed for fiber, for what they call herd, which is a little bit uh, more of the inside of this. And all those things can be used um, for building things like hemp wood, which you're seeing here. So this is all made out of hemp, extremely hard. It's, it's basically analogous to oak wood in its characteristics, but much cheaper. And it only takes about four and a half months to grow this as opposed to 80 years for a um, oak tree. So you basically tongue and groove this stuff um, and put that, you can obviously get it in different, um, they don't put chemicals on this. There's no chemicals um, used, all natural. And so um, this right now is becoming a, a very popular um, use of this lovely. You look inside of one of these, you can see all the fiber in there, um, fiber and herd. And so um, inside of here, this is what makes it extremely resilient, versatile, insulative, um, flame retardant, water, um, not resist, water, um, trying to think of a cool word to say, all you have to do is dry it when it's finished. Um, you don't have to replace the wood. You don't have to um, dig it out. What you hear from Gail is she's using hempcrete, um, which is a different type of use of this um, plant. Basically, um, taking that herd, which is that inner core, and mixing it with lime and water and any combination of those to build basically what really equates to a, a very hard, um, intuitive, um, secure, mold resistant um, structure, which you can use. In building new buildings, um, as she will talk to you about, she has a historic building in Ellicott City, and she's been using this because she's been in basically the last 10 years, some, I think, two to three catastrophic floods that really took out the majority of old Ellicott City in Maryland. And she has taken it upon herself, said, not me. And so from that last one, she's been starting to build her house up with this hemp lime or hempcrete, this mixture. And so we're going to talk about that today with Gail, and I'm very much looking forward to it. She's been an innovator in this, and she's been in this industry for five to six years. But again, um, this this industry in the U.S. is in its very early phases. Um, the good news is we're not recreating the wheel. This has already been done overseas. But what we have to do is put those other three wheels on the car, right? So if you have um, sort of the knowledge of how to grow hemp and the right type of hemp because hemp for CBD and hemp for industrial um, use, basically two different um, seeds, two different ways of growing it. Um, the goal is to have the one plant serve both. Um, and that's been done in some cases, but not pre it's not prevalent within the farming community right now because most people grow for CBD, um, not necessarily fiber. And the people growing it for fiber don't necessarily grow it for CBD or THC. And so, um, what we have now is a industry here in the U.S. that can take all those lessons learned from the Europeans and from the Chinese on how to use this stuff so we don't have to recreate the wheel. But what we need to do is inspire um, our farmers and reward our farmers for growing the super plant. Um, it's beautiful to grow because it doesn't take a lot of care and feeding. You don't need pesticides. Like I said, it rejuvenates the soil that it's in. Um, it grows fast. It grows in mostly, you know, decent temperature ranges. So you can at least get one grow period, sometimes two grow periods um, in, in some of the regions. And so the farmers, our mascot behind us, because we, again, are here to help farmers, one, understand the value of growing this stuff, provide the value to the farmers vis-a-vis -vis making sure they're paid properly, make sure they're paid um, adequately 
and they should also get rewarded from the use and the growth of this market. And there's a whole conversation around that at a different time at different place, but the farmers are the most important. After that, the processing plants, the things that take that stock and run them through to create the herd fiber and the, um, and the bass fiber and all that. Those, we have a couple of them in the U S and they're very, um, very nice lot in the Midwest um, where the farmers are. So they put these plants right next to the farmers, which makes a lot of sense. Um, but there's a need, if we're going to grow more, we need to be able to process more. And so we need to inspire the processors and the people who want to get into processing to build those processing plants. And then it really, after that, this is um, a very fragmented market. So there's people doing great things in different places all over the United States. And what you notice when you start talking to all these people, they have great ideas. They want the best for this country and the environment, but there's no um, composite place where we can all go to have these conversations um, and not only have conversations, but be able to um, talk about the things that we're doing and how we're doing it and really um, inspire the market to understand what industrial hemp is, how it's different than hemp and the power of the super plant. Um, so with that, that's the, um, basis for this podcast. It's a, it's a means, um, to an end. We want to educate, we want to communicate, and we want to get the stories of people being, that have been doing this for a while out to the general public. So you guys can understand this isn't a nasty plant. It is a plant that you should not be afraid of. This is a plant that can do amazing things. And if we just unleash the power of the farming community and the innovation around our manufacturers who are building things like hemp wood and hempcrete and, you know, nano boards, um, China built basically a nano board out of hemp that basically supports better heat dissipation because of the insulative qualities of hemp. I don't think we can stop with the ways that we can ultimately use this plant but we at least got to start the conversation. And so today, as I mentioned, we have Gail Killen, Ellicott City resident, Ellicott City, old Ellicott City, Maryland. She will tell you about her um, trials and tribulations, what uh, the environment, meaning the, the floods, the winds, the destruction has brought to her community and how she has taken upon herself to figure out a way to build that community up so that's more resilient the next time these floods come. So welcome, Gail Killen. All right, Gail, I think we um, can get going. Why don't you introduce yourself? Hey, Dwayne, thanks so much for your interest and for the opportunity. <laughs> Uh, I love sharing information about this. I've learned so much in the last few years. So, um, you know, I, I've actually been in natural building for a really long time since I was a kid. Um, and I bought this house on Main Street in historic Ellicott City because it had great bones and, you know, a nice half acre in a beautiful watershed in the Patapsco Valley. <clears throat> and then in 2011, we got our first thousand year storm and it gutted most of my neighbors. I learned a lot from, you know, watching how the water was moving through the watershed. And I also recognized that I was not going to be able to use conventional building materials if I wanted to preserve this structure. Some neighbors had some cool ideas of using corrugated sheet metal uh, for the bottom four feet of their walls so that they wouldn't have to redo drywall every time. Um, but I, of course, began researching natural building materials. Um, so I, I learned about hempcrete through, um, through that network of people, uh, but it was still difficult to find examples here in the U.S. or anyone with real experience here in the U.S. So. I started reading books and um, picking the brains of some builders in France and New Zealand to, to wrap my head around how this material really works and can it perform the way I'm thinking it needs to. I need something that you know, can be wet proofed, something that can take a, a, a flash flood and, and keep on going. So um, turns out 
it's an ideal material for wet proofing a home, but at that point, the materials weren't available. Um, so some time passed and I continued learning as much as I could. And then in 2016, uh, here on Main Street, we had our second thousand year storm. And that one gutted this house almost entirely, uh, all utilities, electric, plumbing. Um, so it was it was go time, you know. I, I certainly was not about to put anything back the way it was. It was time to march this house forward for another couple hundred years. And uh, so I picked up a, a bell mixer and put it in my basement. And uh, fortunately, industrial hemp was legal by then. So I had some herds, some hemp herds and lime binder shipped in from Chicago from a company called US Heritage. So that was how I got my start in hemp building. So, um, you know, out of all the natural building materials out there, what got you focused on the, the hemp piece? Was it something you just knew about or is it through all those readings? I mean, because there's so many options out there, or at least decent options. Um, what was what would make what made you pick this super plant? Well, um, you know, there there are definitely earth ships and earth buildings that that are you know perform in disaster situations like earthquakes and hurricanes and and things like that. Uh, what really appealed to me about hempcrete was how light it was. Uh, and that it performed as an insulator. So I'm, I didn't have to rebuild the whole house. I could use the existing great bones and cast this insulation material in and around them. So that hemp herd is your insulator, but it's also performing as a moisture mitigator. Um, and then a lime binder is mold prohibitive. And so, so when the hemp cree dries in place, it's effectively petrified, you know, like rock. Uh, so it can take a hit. You know, I'm, I'm right here on Main Street and uh, there's a nice hempcrete ball. Yep. Uh, super light, right? Um, so, you know, I, I really, I really appreciated the strength of this material. Um, and, and it's accessible. It's so basic, right? Like somebody like me can throw a bell mixer in their basement, ship in herds, lime binder, and pull some water. And there you go. You know, it's easier than mixing a cake. <laughs> yeah, I think you just made that way easier than it really is. But I'm not sure everyone would be able to do it as well as you've been doing it. Um, I saw how you mixed everything. So at least get your exercise in while you're doing it too, right? Um, is that wall behind you, um, some of the work that you've done? Yeah. So, you know, in 2016, I started with the, the very base perimeter of the structure. Um, and I was specifically paying attention to vulnerable points, like wherever you have dissimilar materials is a point of vulnerability. So between stone and stick. Um, along the, you know, the sill plate, along the foundation, around doors and windows and things like that are, are points of vulnerability. So I started there. And then in 2018, we had our third thousand year flood. <laughs> so I've been here 3000 years. And, um, but I saw the material perform. I saw it perform. Um, and this, you know, this house stayed dry. No flood water entered this house. Now rainwater came in through a window I left open. <laughs> but, I was able to watch that water, you know, move through the, the hempcrete mass and, and breathe out and the structure never changed at all. So once I had that confidence, once I had that experience, I thought, okay, it's time to take it up the walls and through the house. So this is the um, main street facing wall of the house. And I had a little fun with this one um, and, you know, Put an, used an old floorboard for the sill plate and and got into some shaping around the window. Um, you know, it takes a couple of weeks before the hempcrete mass has solidified to where you, you can't put a dent in it. 
um, which is great because it means you have a little bit of time to sharpen up a corner or round out a corner or patch a hole or, you know, fix a little something here and there. So it's, it actually is very, very forgiving other than lime. Lime is caustic to the skin. So you definitely want to wear protection. Um, but it, but it is, it is, um, you know, surprisingly easy to work with. It's basic, right? We're talking about one part water, one part lime binder, four parts hemp herd, right? And that's about as, about as easy as it gets, you know? And then how do you apply it? Um, you just slap it on or is there a process by which you have to sort of build it or, you know, I, I know they're talking about, you know, hemp creep blowers and all that other stuff, but yeah. you know, how, how did you go about doing this? Yeah. There's lots of really cool things going on in that, in that regard. Um, you know, hemp blocks are an amazing, uh, building block for the future. Spraying machines are great. Cast spraying, um, you know, builds out the wall. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, it takes, takes a little bit of learning to get used to the machine. In, in this instance, though, um, when, you know, when you're trying to renovate a, a, an, an existing structure like this, you know, that stone um, structure was built in 1809. This stick frame went on in 1888. So none of these studs are the same size. None of them are, you know, equal distance, of, you know, from each other. Um, so you you know, there's nothing very regular about an old house. So what I did here was I used a form, much like you would when working with concrete. Um, I used a form, I made my mix in the mixer, and then I put this form up against the wall. Different walls, I did different depths, right? Depending on, on how thick I wanted that wall to be. Um, so I So I make my mix, I drop it in, to this form and I'm packing it and I'm making sure it's getting in every little nook and cranny. You know, old houses have lots of little nooks and crannies and the better you seal it, the more protected you are, you know, from any cold moisture, pests, what have you. So getting into all those little corners is tedious and that does take time. It's not hard, but it takes time. So the cool thing though, is that that form can immediately be lifted and moved up to the next level where concrete, you've got to leave that form in place until the, the mass has cured. With hempcrete, there's no slump. There's no, the, the, the walls th that you have put into place is, is going to stay exactly as you put it. So you just move your form up the wall and you continue, you can kind of see these lines, right? Um, that, that light line there is a day that I stopped. And then the next day I came back in and you can see that darker line above it. So um, it's actually, you know, pretty easy to learn. It's, it's pretty straightforward, I think. From everything you've seen so far, is it everything you thought it would be? Uh, is it more, is it less? Yeah. Or is it just right? Yeah, and then it's, it's, it's more, right? So it's overwhelming. When you first start learning about everything that Hempcrete can do, um, you know, it's fireproof, it's flood proof, it's, you know, mold proof, it's this, that, the other, right? Pests can't, you know, or don't want to chew through it. Um, it's a lot, you know, and I had, I had a very fixed focus. I needed to protect this structure from a town that's being inundated by flash flooding. So once it was in though, now I've got this wall here right on Main Street, and now I realize it's a sound insulator. And it was after the fact that I found out recording studios have been using this material specifically for that purpose. So definitely, definitely has performed better than, than I expected. Yeah, and I believe given where you're located there's quite a few bars on that street it probably keeps you from waking up at two well, unless you're in the bars um, <laughs> keeps you at least from hearing those passing drunks you know walking by your door and your windows um, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> but um when that's a trust me when you're in a city right you you'd like to be insulated from all that kind of peripheral noise um and if this is doing that that's amazing do you see um a how are you going to finish that? Are you going to finish it? Do you think, you know, what what are your plans for how you're going to, you know, sort of cap off? And I know it's an ongoing forever thing, but 
you know, what are your, your thoughts on how, what you're going to do next? Well, um, I, you know, still have a, a long way to go to bring the hempcrete insulation into the house. Um, there's a two-story addition across the back of these two houses as well. So I, I want to get it up into that second level uh, before I begin finishing the walls. But my intention is to plaster. Um, you know, once the, once these walls are plastered, it's just going to look like any other old house, you know, in any other old town with a nice plaster wall. And I've got, you know, some options. So <clears throat> when you're plastering a hempcrete wall on the outside, you want that to be a lime plaster for sure. And, you know, so that it can perform against the, the weather and the elements. Um, but on the interior, you've got a little bit of, you know, wiggle room and you can go with clay plasters. And I happen to love playing with clay plasters. Um, so I, I, I will find some areas in this house where I can, you know, do some whimsical, artsy, fun stuff. Um, and then I'll also try to, to, to do some demonstration areas, you know, and, and show what a nice flat wall can, can look like. Yeah, and so you're sort of like a reflection of um, innovation in your community. I, I know from just seeing, like before I even knew you, seeing all the, the stuff that you were doing to kind of educate folks and try to help them understand what it might take to harden these structures for the next flood. And you talk a little bit about, about that work and how your, you know, your outreach efforts, you know, all those good things that you're doing for the community. Well, um, you know, I try, I don't know how much good I'm doing, but uh, I'll tell you something, um, a traumatizing event, like a disaster, really. Mm. <laughs> you know, disasters really bond communities. It's, um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of really beautiful people that, that rise to the occasion when you have, a, a, you know, a thing like these flash floods coming through so um you know a lot of lot of lot of work in that regard that's that's an overwhelming bigger picture thing you know in terms of how do we manage the water around us so you know like i said i've got a half acre here and i'm, I'm right between main street and the hudson branch which is one of the three tributaries that feeds into the patapsco river at the bottom of the the hill here <clears throat> we're about halfway so uh, the river's that way, the ridge is that way, and we're right here at the halfway point. So it's a great, the, the Hudson Branch crosses Main Street right here. And so I have a really unique opportunity to slow the flow for downstream and for my own home. So, you know, some of the, some of the impactful things that I've done to protect the house has had to do with variegations in the land and landscape. Um, you know, different plants and and features, you know, like that to kind of manage that that water as it comes through and give it give it somewhere to go. It sounds very complicated. So we just want it to go somewhere other than my house. Is all. And plant. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Or maybe someone else's. You, you don't want to create the whole tunnel funnel into your neighbor's house. Yeah, but you know, and that's, have a waterfall? I think that's really that bigger picture concept, you know. So this is for posterity. This is for the future, you know. I, what I hope is that, you know, years and years, hundreds of years after I'm long gone, what I'm hoping is, is this continues to be a non-toxic home that is strong and resilient through whatever life brings. And that, you know, the yard and, and land attached to it serves to provide that for the community as well. So I think that we have a great opportunity with, um, you know, the introduction of hempcrete into the building world it really it, it changes the future for so many with chemical sensitivities and asthma and you know there are a lot of folks that really just are having a hard time finding a non-toxic home to live in so the fact that this you know this is pretty is becoming it's fast becoming accessible nice i kind of feel like in the future it'll be like the pyramids 
right? Everyone will wonder how she built this house. Like, what was all this stuff? And <laughs> how many people did it take to do it? No, it was just her. Yeah, they say hempcrete um, will last for hundreds and hundreds of years, if not thousands. And so I, I sometimes wonder what it might look like. You know, these old bones are, you know, from 1888. But what if the bones all disintegrate and all you see is like yeah. the fossil of my hempcrete yep. insulation? <laughs> Yeah, it would just be standing hempcrete, no, nothing else, right. just like little <laughs> sections of it. Um, so I don't want to take too much of your time because I appreciate all the time you've taken, but I kind of want to get a sense for how, or you know, I'm from Baltimore for, for um, what you see of this industry, um, knowing you know where we've been as a country and the regulations we put on on this as an evil plant and all those. Um, things that kept us from really um, embracing the power of this plant for all purposes, you know, the, the, the leaves, the buds, the seeds, but for us, the stalk just seems to have so much um, real use um, potential. So what are your general thoughts about the industry as a whole? Where do you think we are? Where do you think we should go? Um, you know, and your thoughts in general, since you've been part of this from feels like, long time <laughs> three thousand years right um well you know i think we're in a, a space now we're in a safe space where we can talk about cannabis uh you know i can google it on my phone without worrying about somebody knowing that i'm in the cannabis space um you know so so that's definitely improved education and communications uh, and in general learning um i think that farmers are also experiencing that kind of awakening you know the the plant really sells itself the 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 fact that it's removing toxins from the soil as it's growing and when you harvest that and then store it in your building you're, you're now providing carbon storage so even you know when you're having your building materials shipped the the carbon neutral or negative aspect of this material can negate you know some of the, the that carbon in in the atmosphere so i think it's going to to make itself really clearly an economic win um very soon so i guess what i'm most excited about is getting processing for our for our farmers so that you know i love my my hemp clothing uh, it performs so beautifully, you know, the way it manages, you know, body heat and, and uh, moisture and whatnot is really impressive. And, you know, once you're wearing something, you can feel how strong it is. And, um, you know, you, I've got some hemp t-shirts that I've been wearing for, you know, over 10 years. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, like I- And you never washed them either, <laughs> I think, right? Cause it's like odor resistant too. Right? <laughs> So I really think, you know, it, it speaks for itself, right? Like you've been to my house, you know, and, and you've seen the builders kick my walls and, um, you know, you've, you've seen it perform, you know, in my experiments where I've got, you know, sections that I'm intentionally letting it take water so I can see how it performs. And, you know, all these experiments are, are the proof you, you can Google, you know, some YouTube videos of people trying to set hempcrete on fire, you know, like it, it really speaks for itself. So I think we're just, we're in that, in that phase where we go from being afraid to talk about hemp, being afraid to say the word, maybe being a little annoyed because whenever you try to talk about building, people talk about smoke in your house. <laughs> you know, like, but I think we're, you know, we're, we're on our way. It's here. And, um, you know, we just, we got to get some some support for our farmers, right? They, they always they always need our support. We're, um, we can show up for our farmers. That's right. Have a catalyst and um, stand up some processing. Let's get some central processing units going, and you know a place where farmers can drop that herd. And and I don't know. Maybe we're making plastics. Maybe we're making um, you know bedding for animals maybe we're making biochar who knows but these possibilities are yeah that hemp wood is great stuff um i've got a little bit of that here in the house too that i'm having fun with so strong kind of difficult to work with it's so strong like these like this old timber 
right? New lumber just can't perform anymore. So it's not that this will necessarily push lumber out of the industry or out of the market. It's that new lumber simply doesn't perform like old lumber or hemp wood. So it's just a no brainer. It's speaking for itself, I think. Well, and I think ultimately there's, I mean, you're talking about the, the seed to harvest kind of some time frame of like four to five months versus 80 years for an oak tree. It's like 45 days, isn't and it? it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's crazy. And the amount of carbon this stuff is absorbing, I think it's like four times the the same, you know, from tree acreage. Yeah, there's some places so, in the world that can get like two growing seasons in. Yep. Yeah, I think when we were talking to Greg, I might have mentioned this to you. He might have been on the call too from Hempwood. I mean, he was talking about standing in the middle of a, a hemp field and how euphoric you feel just because of the vast amount of carbon intake and and the oxygen oh. outtake or the out oxygen that came out of the plants that you would just feel like like you're in vegas an, is what he said an atmospheric um, impact sure yeah so just it's kind of cool just to see that element of it um you know we're not going to heal the world all in one day or one year or two years but i think this super plant becomes the basis for changing those industries to be friendlier to the environment i mean the destructive qualities of of plastic and some of these other things um if you can replace it and you can do it in an environmentally friendly way why would you not do that you know this is like like you said it's like a duh kind of moment when um, when we're able to make this more accessible um you know the economics are going to fall into place and really the economics are always the driver you know it's not that people didn't want to go solar right it, it's not that, that they didn't want children to breathe better air it's it's that they you know had a choice and they had to choose the you know more affordable choice so i think our job is to get you know the economic train rolling because this is going to be an economic win yeah and there's no doubt that that is the key right is it's the farmer, convincing yeah. our farming community yeah that this is a viable um, path for, um, you know, wealth, farmer wealth and legacy and all those things that farm farmers have, you know, been working their butts off for, yeah. but always a little bit short because of whatever. Right. Um, I know a lot of the farming community now is, is struggling because the pesticides that they're using for regular crop growth are more expensive than ever. Right. Right. And this weed does not necessarily require or need that much pesticide or care and feeding even and so hopefully an easier grow for the farmer less cost of goods sold for the farmer and we get this demand um, signal going along with the supply signal get those manufacturers manufacturing cool stuff getting people like you just to communicate the fact that this is real and it really works um, is critical so again thank you for being our first guest um, and you will be our best guest i'm sure um, but is there anything, any parting words before we end? Um, and, you know. Well, well, I would just say, uh, you know, thanks again for, for having me and for getting this conversation going. And if anybody wants to learn more, I think the best place to start is with the United States Hemp Building Association. They've been there um, tracking who's doing what and, and getting education out there. They worked really hard last year. So Hempcrete is now in building code thanks to their efforts. And they, they possess a wealth of knowledge. Um, so they're great for networking and information. So I, I highly recommend folks get out there and start doing your Googling and figure out, you know, where, where can, can you fit into to this revolution? Or they just call you and you'll tell them. <laughs> You know, I, I can't can stop talking about number? it. So, <laughs> No, I mean, look, and you've been doing it. You're probably just wondering why is everyone excited about this now, right? <laughs> you've been doing this for a while. And so I feel a little guilty of the fact that I've just realized the power of this plan. Well, you know, it, so, it's funny you say that. Better late than never. It's funny you say that because this T-shirt is, you know, about Hemp History Week from – 2013 this was from 10 years ago when they were saying let's you know help american farmers grow hemp and so we're early to the game but we're late to the game <laughs> yeah 
I think that history yeah. is going to help us. I think it's a win. There's we've got farmers that remember our history, you know, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, the Midwest, you know, this is going to it's going to be easy to to kick right back into step, I think. Yeah, that is my hope. Um, like I said, sort of provide the opportunity for the farmers, inspire the manufacturers to really embrace this as a true industrial um, core for a lot of things they do, and then have the community stop looking at hemp um, as a something evil or something illegal or even something less than um, a very valuable part of what our industries can absorb in order to be, you know, better for the environment and be more structurally so sound and well as well in many of these things. So um, thank you again. And we'll have you again probably on a, in a little bit later when you've done some more work and you can tell us some other things. And I do appreciate your advocacy to this industry. And I appreciate your mentorship already to us. Um, people that haven't been here long, um, I've learned a lot from you. So I appreciate that and keep up the good work. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much, Dwayne. All right. Let's see. Thank you.